Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries and in this video I'm going to be reviewing the BX Essentials Core line written by Gavin Norman and produced by Necrotic Gnomes Publishing. <laughs> Okay, so we have a bit of a departure from the norm here since I'm not reviewing a single book. I'm reviewing the BX Core line, which consists of the following books. The Core Rules book, the Classes and Equipment book, the Cleric and Magic User Spells book, the Monsters book, and finally the Adventures and Treasures book. The reason I've decided to do this is because these five books are effectively collecting and tidying up the old D&D BX rules and then splitting them down into smaller books. So why have they done this? The author's reason for creating this game is through all his years of play what he always missed was a cleanly presented easy to reference rendition of the core rules of the game separated from the associated accoutrements of the classes the spells monsters magic items etc and that is exactly what he has done splitting the core rules classes and equipment spells monsters and jamming advice into separate small cheap and cheerful booklets that can be applied or not as the case may be but Gavin doesn't intend to stop there. In his foreword for the final book in the core series, Adventures and Treasures, he says, BX Essentials will not end where the traditional BX rules end. The modular approach taken in the design of these books makes it trivial to swap out parts of the traditional game with replacements. So, having established a baseline, a cleaned up version of the BX rules, Necrotic Gnome is going to start branching out in the future and publishing books that you can switch in or substitute with the existing ones to give your game different flavours. As someone who is a fan of toolkit style approaches, I wholeheartedly support this and I can't wait to see what other stuff they're going to do in the future. I hope other people pick up this idea and run with it as well. So, on to the rating. Now, if you've not seen one of my reviews before, I give a rating and a brief summary at the start of the review for people who are too busy to watch the whole thing. Each book, or in this case, series of books, is rated a blank, a plus, or a minus in four categories. These are then added up to give a final rating. So, for the writing, I've given the books a plus. The writing in the BX Essentials books is clean and clear. There have been a few errors that have crept in here and there that have had errata published for them, but this doesn't mar the quality of the writing. Now, you could ask yourself, how much of the writing is the author's when this is a faithful reprint of the D&D BX rules? However, the effort that has gone into cleaning it up, clarifying contradictions, and making it a good deal more legible, more than justifies the plus rating, in my opinion. For the look of the book, I'm also giving it a plus. The books look great in my opinion. They are small digest size books, as you can see here, which is always a good thing in my opinion. They're centre stapled with some cool cartoon style artwork from Andrew Walter. We can see some there on the Core Rules book with a wizard fighting against some sort of dragon. The interior of the books have a two column layout with text that is large enough to read easily, even for those of us without brilliant eyesight. And there is a scattering of black and white art from various artists throughout the line. The artwork is great. It's got that old school feel and more importantly, in my opinion, is rarely intrusive, being used to accent and enhance the text. It puts me in the mind of the little pictures and placeholders you used to get in the old fighting fantasy books. The sections are divided with clear headings and tables, of which there are many, nicely accented in a light shade of green. That is enough to make them stand out on the page without being overly complex or burdensome on the eye. For the system, I've given it a plus. Now, given how many people, myself included, love D&D, it would be hard not to give this a plus, particularly since it represents one of my favourite iterations of the system, the old BX rules. 
I've got a print on demand copy of the old Raw's Cyclopedia for D&D and checking through this bad boy I can see that the Raw's have been faithfully represented in the BX Essentials line save in a few places where the author has clarified or attempted to resolve potential conflicts in the system this is no bad thing for the background I've given the book line a blank and that's because there's not really a background as such in the BX Essentials line since it's more about presenting the rules in an easy to access format and then letting you do whatever you see fit with regards to the setting although the Adventures and Treasures book does make several assumptions about the sort of game you'll be playing in order to present advice and tools for the GM to use now given that this is a D&D based game though it's a fairly safe bet that most people will at some point use it to run a pseudo medieval fantasy game. So I don't think that's too much of a stretch overall. So adding together our scores, we can see this gives a rating of plus three, which is good. The BX Essentials line is a great tidied up version of the old D&D basic expert rules, representing them faithfully and generally blowing the cobwebs off them and giving them a bit of a spruce up. As the author himself says, not finding my holy grail basic expert reference anywhere, I was inspired to create this book. Now, I suspect there are several of you already champing at the bit, saying, But John, there's a million and one OSR games, all of which do different things with the D&D rules. They all have their own flavour, and you can buy the rules cyclopedia on drive-thru. Do we really need a copy of the BX rules? My argument would be that, just because there are other OSR games out there, it doesn't invalidate the work that has gone into the BX Essentials line. And, as you say, most other OSR games tweak or change the rules depending on the author's particular preferences. Whereas, in this case, Gavin has faithfully represented the original rules with only minimum clarifications. And you might say, Well, why don't I just buy the rules cyclopedia then? You certainly could do that. However, the Rules Cyclopedia available in print on demand is a presumably scanned copy of the original. It has all the rules, contradictions, mistakes and odd formatting choices of the original. Don't get me wrong, it's great for a nostalgia trip. I've got my own copy that you've just seen, after all, sat right here. If I were looking to run a game using these original rules though, I'd reach for the BX Essentials line every time. I can overlook mistakes and the layout of the cyclopedia because it's an old book I've largely purchased to read and wax nostalgic about. If it comes to actually running the game though, I'll be reaching for my BX Essentials books with their nice clear layout and formatting every time. At the end of the day, if you want to run a faithful version of BX, but you want to have a much more easier time doing it and referencing the rules, pick yourself up the BX Essentials book. Okay, so that's the summary let's go on to the detailed review. Now, since there are five books in the core series, I'm not gonna go through each chapter in minute exhaustive detail, especially since if you're interested in this product in the first place, or even have the vaguest concept of what RPGs are, you've probably heard of D&D. What I'm going to do is look at each of the books in turn and give you an overview of what you get in them. So first of all, let's have a look at the core rules book. It's split into seven sections, all of which are summarised in the introduction and labelled clearly in the contents page. Although these books don't have an index as such, although you do get a nifty index of the various tables in the books, the contents page is extremely thorough and makes it obvious where you can find the various elements of the book. Great stuff. The sections in this book are ability scores, sequence of play, adventuring rules, basic combat procedure, other combat issues, standard combat charts and magic. The Ability Scores section gives you a short breakdown of the standard scores using pretty much all D&D games, Charisma, Constitution, Dex, Intelligence, Strength and Wisdom. We get a page of clear tables showing the standard adjustment modifiers for roles based on these Ability Scores and also other things affected by them, such as Dex affecting initiative and how Charisma determines the number and the loyalty modifiers and the hirelings you can have. The sequence of play section is only a single page long and splits play into three different styles. Dungeon turns for when you're exploring subterranean environments, although obviously dungeons can stretch their dangerous fingers far beyond simple caverns and stone tombs. Wilderness days for when your characters are romping over the landscape, doing a bit of travelling and encounters. 
for when shit gets for when real. shit gets real. Each of these styles is clearly represented in numbered list format, explaining the procedure a GM would go through in each case. For example, in a dungeon turn, the GM checks for wandering monsters, the party decides what action, move, searching, etc. they want to take, the GM describes what happens as a result, if no encounter occurs, then the turn is over and you finish at the next step. If a monster is encountered, you move on to the encounter sequence. And finally, the turn ends, the GM updates their time records, and a new turn begins. The Adventuring Rules is a grab bag of rules you can use to flavour or enhance various situations that probably aren't going to come up all the time. We've got optional rules for ability checks, air travel, chases, naval pursuits climbing, secret doors, traps, encumbrance, and experience points, amongst others. Again, these rules are clearly laid out, and where necessary, tables are provided summarising the most important information. We move on to the basic combat procedure section, which is a nice simple two-page spread, taking you through the different variables and information required to run a normal combat in the game. The author tries to sum up as much pertinent information as possible, providing links and page references to other sections and books in the series, where it's not possible to reproduce the information in full. So you might be saying, Oh, I, I see, so this is their way of getting us to buy all the different books then. Well, not really. I mean, you can if you want. I mean, each book is only $3.99 US in PDF on drive through at the time of creating this video, so it's not exactly expensive. But one of the strengths of the modular design of these this line is that the only person who really needs all the books is the GM. If you're a player, you really only need the classes and equipment book and the core rules book, maybe, along with the spells book if you're playing a caster. The Other Combat Issues section neatly collects the various modifiers and other occasional situations that can occur in combat, such as wanting to knock, or in, knock someone out or incapacitate them, or fighting in water. We then move on to the Standard Combat Charts section, which collects the various charts and tables required for combat. Since this is a faithful adaption of BX, Essentials uses the oft-dreaded FACO, which I know may put some people off, Although, personally, it never really bothered me. Do I find Ascending Armor Class more intuitive? Yes, I do. But let's face it, Thacko is really only very basic maths, and that's all you need. Or a copy of the small handy table from this book, and you're ready to like, rock and roll with Thacko. It's not a major impediment. And the Magic section gives you an overview of how you cast and memorize spells, how spell books work, how you acquire new spells, and it rounds off this first book with a description of how your characters can identify and research magic items. We then move on to the Classes and Equipment book, which I've got there. This book opens with a brilliant piece of black and white art, from Lucas Regek, hopefully you can see that there. And it shows four people in old school diving suits trying to fend off what look like giant eels or fish that have arms and weapons. I love this, the art looks cool, and it also appeals to that slightly gonzo sort of sense that a lot of the old D&D modules had. The book is split into nine sections, character creation, ability scores, character classes, alignment and languages, character advancement, money and wealth, equipment, land and water transportation, mercenaries and specialists, and finally, castles and strongholds. Character creation, some of this has been covered in the core rules, so particularly the ability scores stuff. So here we get a step-by-step -step instruction manual to take us through creating a character, from rolling your ability scores and choosing classes up to picking your character name. We also get a handy attack matrix table at the bottom for anyone who still might be struggling with Thaco. Copy and paste that bad boy to the bottom of your character sheet, you're good to go. Ability scores section next is pretty much a straight copy from the core book. However, it does mean as a player, you probably wouldn't need to use the two books to create your character. All you need is this book here and you're good to go. The next section is character classes, and we have all of the classic classes here. Cleric, Dwarf, Elf, Fighter, Harveling, Magic User, and Thief are all represented as they were in BX. And since it's BX, yes, 
demi-human races are classes in this. I know some people love it, like myself. Other people hate it. But that's how it was in the basic expert roles. That's how it is in the VX Essentials line. We get a list of the various class abilities, the benefits you get, and the modifiers at each level. Every class gets a page giving a brief description of their abilities and limitations, along with the facing page containing their level tables and any other abilities summarized in tables. If you were using the PDF, you could pretty much print out these two pages, attach them to the back of your character sheet, and you'd have all the class-based information you needed to run your character. As a personal aside, I was never particularly keen on the thief having percentile chances of success for their various knavery. I much prefer the X in 6 skill system used in Lamentations of the Flame Princess, but given that these books are an attempt to faithfully represent the BX rules, I can understand why they haven't been changed. We then move on to alignment, and this game sticks to the three-tier alignment style before it got the good slash evil axis introduced of law, neutrality, and chaos. We get a brief description of what each of these mean for a player character before moving on to the languages section. There's a very brief description of languages, the common tongue, alignment languages, and monster languages. There's not really a great deal in this section, to be honest, which is a shame since I think language can be a great plot hook for games, and I'm hoping this is something that expand on in future releases as they start doing their own thing a bit more. In the character advancement section, we get a small paragraph offering basic common sense advice on mixed level parties, along with optional rules for giving different titles to the various levels of different classes. I think this is a cool idea. I mean, it's it's just so much more badass to say I'm Swordmaster Joshua Daniels rather than I'm Joshua Daniels level three fighter or whatever. The next section is money and wealth. BX Essentials uses the gold piece standard. We get a breakdown of starting money and how the exchange rates for the different coinages stack up. There's also a section on inheritance where player characters can leave some of their gear and money to their next character in a will. I'm not sure how fond of, I am of this idea, although it does have built-in limits. It's not something I've used before in a game. We move on to the equipment section, and it provides minimal information on equipment, presuming we all know what a lantern and a short sword are. Pretty much a few tables containing the name, costing gold pieces, and the weight of equipment in coins. Although we do get some very basic descriptions on the following page. The land transportation section provides costs and speed for various beasts and vehicles, such as carts and wagons. We also get abbreviated stats for the various beasts, and are directed to the monster book for the full stats. There's not a massive amount of detail here, but more than enough to decide how much stuff the PCs can cram into their carts and how fast their poor beleaguered horses can pull them. The water transportation section is pretty much the same as the previous chapter, but it provides a smattering of quasi-historical boats and ocean-going vessels, along with some rules for seaworthiness and high winds. I particularly like that vessels are either seaworthy, ocean-going, or not the latter being restricted to lakes, rivers, or coastal waters. We also get some additional details and nuances for naval combat, repairing damaged vessels, and the sort of weaponry your ships may be packing. Although, given that this is BX, we don't get any black powder weapons, so you'll have to belay any thoughts of launching a fiery broadside at your enemy. We next move on to the mercenaries section, who are sort of like soldiers and guards hired to patrol and protect whilst in the wilderness. We get details for hiring footmen, archers, etc. and what their wages would be. There are even orc and goblin wages, presumably for less scrupulous groups. Since mercenaries are hired to perform specific services, they don't count towards a maximum number of retainers a PC can hire. Although I'm not sure what happens if they're ordered into a dungeon or the like, presumably they refuse. Specialists are similar to the mercenaries say that these are NPCs hired for non-combat and non-adventuring situations like smithing and alchemy and such like. The guidelines on what these NPCs can do is clearly laid out and it handily fends off awkward questions like how much armour can my armourer make from players. Castles and strongholds are a staple of classic D&D. Certain character types, when they reach an appropriate level, may want to put down roots and build their own fortress. This is presented in a step-by-step -step fashion, ranging all the way from getting permission from the landowner right down to choosing features and calculating the cost, all of which is fit into a mere three pages. 
We now move on to the Clerics and Magic User Spells book. And this pretty much does what it says on the tin. You can see that there. It's a list of the available BX Magic Users and Cleric Spells divided by level. Although, as the author says, in writing this book, he has continued to place heavy focus on the usability of the text during play. To this end, in contrast to the usual block of text style of spell presentation, he has broken each spell's description into logical chunks. Thus, the presentation of the spells differs somewhat from what you will find in the original basic expert books. I think this is a wise choice overall. Removing ambiguities and confusion allows you to more quickly reference a spell and prevents arguments about what precisely their effects are. It's all laid out for you in black and white. We next move on to the Monsters book. And again, it's a pretty straightforward book that is more for the GM than some of the previous books. We get a basic description of the layout style, some notes on XP, and then we're pretty much straight into the monster stat blocks. There's not a lot in the way of ecology notes or the like for these monsters, but to be honest, since most of them are fairly well known or obvious, it's not really 100% necessary. The stat blocks are very clear and easy to reference. There is an entertaining spread of creatures containing all of those from the original basic slash expert edition. We're now going to move on to the most recently released, as of time of recording, book of the BX Essentials line, and the one that I was most looking forward to, if truth be told, the Adventures and Treasures book. And this is pretty much what I like to think of as the big GM book of tools for running a game. And it does seem to have a slightly higher page count than the other books in the series. Again, though, only the GM really needs this book. The book contains guidelines for writing adventures in dungeons and the wilderness, tables for rolling random encounters, procedures for placing treasure hoards, and a smorgasbord of magic items you can scatter throughout your campaign. Okay, so in terms of adventure scenarios, we start off with a list of 10 standard adventure scenarios and a brief description. Most of these will be familiar to anyone who has run or played RPGs before, but it's nice to have these things written down as a reminder. Whilst I was reading through it, I started getting a few ideas coming to mind for my own games. Don't get me wrong, it's no S. John Ross big list of RPG plots, another great resource I use, and I'll put a link to this in the description. But it's a good basic grounding in the staples of adventuring for a newer GM. The section titled Designing Dungeons gives some brief advice on designing dungeons, explaining that you should choose a setting, choose monsters, map the dungeon, and then stock it. Again, none of this advice is exactly new or revolutionary, but the book does a great job of covering the basics and provides some handy random tables to help stock a dungeon if the GM is struggling for ideas. The sections on designing a wilderness and a base town are pretty similar to the one on dungeon design, just with different focuses. Again, a lot of the advice is pretty basic, but I like the way in which it sets down the key things you need to do to have the necessary information present to portray the wilderness or a town without talking down to the reader or assuming that they have a vast prior knowledge of RPGs. We then get some standard random encounter tables for the different environments that could easily be used in pretty much any OSR games. This follows up with a section on stronghold encounters giving us brief guidelines for detailing the rulers and protectors of a stronghold and how they might react to a posse of adventurers rolling up on their doorstep we then have a section on npc parties that gives guidelines on how to randomly roll up a party of npc adventurers if you generate them as an encounter although to be honest the tables for determining class and level are quite cool but you'd still have to roll up stats and equipment etc for each adventurer so it's not really something i'd recommend doing on the fly i think it'd probably be better to have a couple of pre-prepared npc adventuring parties ready and like noted down on index cards or post sticks or whatever and you can then just pull them out if an npc party gets rolled finally we have a section on placing treasure this offers a couple of different methods of placing treasure in your game and we get a number of tables using the old letter codes where you can roll the various amounts of coins and loot that either individual creatures possess or that are guarded in their hordes. A nice addition here is a smaller version of the exchange rate chart provided in case you want to splash out on different denominations of coins. 
Although if you need to work it out in a hurry, I recommend using the D&D 5e coin converter online, which as far as I'm aware, uses the same exchange rates. And I'll put a link to that again in the description. We then get to a section on gems and jewellery. Although we don't get much in the way of description when it comes to gems, which is a shame in my opinion, the game focuses pretty much entirely on how much they're worth. Next, the book replicates some information from the earlier books about identifying and using magic items. There's also an interesting section on the limitations and power of wishes, before the book closes with a big list of various different magic items. I like that, again, the author has gone to lengths to minimise the amount of book slash page flipping that is required, including as many of the rules related to the various magic items in this book as possible. So, in conclusion, if you're looking for a series of books that represents the basic expert edition of D&D without fiddling with it or altering it in any way, save in order to make it easier to read and to tidy up contradictions in the original source material, then the BX Essentials line could be for you. Or if you want a game where your players can each pick up all the stuff they need in PDF for about $6 US, give it a look. Even for the GM, it's only going to cost you about $15 US for the entire core set in PDF. I'd advise you to give it a look. The print copies are great quality and fairly cheap as well. So I hope you've enjoyed that review of the BX Essentials game line by Necrotic Gnome. If you've enjoyed the video, please feel free to like and subscribe to our channel. Feel free to comment in the comments box below. I do enjoy reading what you write. Have fun, whatever you're playing, and we'll see you next time. Take care.